welcome to How to Teach Right Start Math Level A. My name is Eve Hullett. We're going to be um, walking through Level A today. Okay, some quick webinar information. If everybody can make sure their sound is muted. And if you have any questions, just use the chat box. Okay, let's get going. Placement guidelines. So who belongs in Level A? Um, anyone starting kindergarten, Level A is the place to start. Or if last year you just had a, a real life kindergarten experience, um, did kind of a brief overview of addition, then you want to go ahead and start in Level A as well. Now also, if you have a younger child who, um, who is just really, really interested in numbers and quantities and, and wanting to, to learn, then um, Level A is a great place to start and you can just kind of go at their, their pace. Maybe you're doing more like two or three lessons a week. And again, just um, to the extent that they're still enjoying it. Okay, what do you need for Level A? You're gonna need your book bundle, and your math set. Okay, um, in the front of level A, you'll have the objective, so you can go ahead and see what's gonna be covered over the year. So you can see the categories are here, your numeration, money, place value, addition, subtraction, problem solving, geometry, time, measurement, and fractions. And then you can use this section over here each quarter if it's white, then that's what's when it's going to be covered. And so as a year goes along, you can kind of check off what you've covered or maybe make a note, hey, you know what, this is something we need to make sure we're reviewing or maybe play an extra game on. Um, so it can just kind of keep you on track and see where you're, where you're heading, where you've been. Okay, in the front of all of your Right Start lesson books, there's five different pages of some really helpful information. So, um, Things just about how the program was developed, some general thoughts on teaching math, how the daily lessons are set up. So we recommend that you read these just once a year um, as you're getting ready to teach, or sometimes maybe around that Christmas break, and it, um, the first time you read, you'll be like, oh, okay, but then the second time, you'll be like, oh, that's what they're talking about. Okay, that's right, that's why we do that. Um, and so it, it's just really helpful to, to, again, see where you're heading and why we're doing what we're doing. Table of contents, here's level A's table of contents. You can see we have 132 lessons. So if you have a 180 day school year, it ends up being about four to five days a week. So whether you have a regular four day a week or you use that fifth day for games, it also gives you a little buffer if um, you're um, just clicking along and you get to something that, you know, your child, you know what, we need to spend an extra day on this. We need to just play games today on, on that concept. And so there's, there's some wiggle room in the school year. You can see here that throughout the school year, there's some assessments and reviews. At the end of the year, we review everything that's been covered. Um, and again, it has a, a little assessment on that as well. How are the lessons formatted? Well, we can see here um, it's a sample lesson, lesson 47. The first thing to look at on a lesson is the objectives. This is going to tell you, am I introducing a concept? Um, or are we really supposed to kind of be mastering at this point? What is the goal of this lesson? Um, so that's all going to be there in the objectives. And then whatever materials you're going to need for the day. And then the activities will be on the left. And any tips or explanations will be on your right. Each lesson is going to start with a warm up. And so everything is spelled out for you. So, exactly what to say, and even the answers are right there in brackets for you. So, you step through your warm up and you go on to your daily activity, and it's listed out exactly how to present the lesson. Um, if there's a worksheet, um, they'll let you know. And here you can see there's a little tip that you might want to keep extra copies of this worksheet. You continue through, there's a little tip, go on through. At the end, there's a conclusion. This might be a summary of the day's lesson, or um, it, might, it might be something to just kind of extend the lesson for the child to think on. It might be a little challenging um, as well. Okay, so 
let's look at some of the games you might play in the very beginning of level, um, level A. One of them is just ordering. And so you can see here, um, here's the finger cards. They're actually the appendix pages that you receive with level A. And so here's just putting them in order. Um, then the tally cards, placing them in order. And the B cards. Now, if you notice, there's actually more than one way to order something. That, that seems like um, not really a big deal to us as adults, but for the kids, it's, it's another nuance that they're expanding their understanding of quantities, and, um, and so it's all in there for a purpose. So if you notice each of the games, you're like, those are very similar, then um, you'll probably see there's something just slightly different that we're bringing out another concept with. Okay, games. Why do we play games? Games are to math what books are to reading. They give us an interesting repetition that we need for that automatic response. And so just like when we're learning how to read, we don't use flashcards to practice our reading. We give our kids books. We read to them. We read with them. We have them read um, and hopefully interesting books so they see what they're doing, why they're doing it, and want to do it more. That's the same thing with games. They give a way to apply the new information they've been learning, and they're doing it in a social um, setting. If you play 15 minutes of a game, that's the same as a child doing a worksheet all by themselves. Um, the lessons are going to tell you which games to play according to whatever concept you're going over. And if you want some extra practice or review, you have the card game book um, right there in your math set, and so you can replay games you've played before, or if you go to the table of contacts, contents, you can pick out a topic and find other games um, to practice and, and review concepts you're interested in. Um, we also suggest keeping a game log. And so what you can do is, is you can just put down, you know, the date and what card game you played, maybe who played it, um, maybe any notes, yeah, this game really worked well, or we changed this part of it, or um, it was helpful with this concept. Um, that can be helpful, one, to see at the end of the year what you did, but also with um, when you have other children coming up, you can look back and, and kind of see, okay, well, that's what I did with Susie. Let's see what we should do um, with this one. Okay, now I want you to notice here the worksheet. There's a worksheet on this lesson, but it's lesson 17 but we're on worksheet number two. Well, why aren't we doing more worksheets? Remember the games, 15 minutes of a game is a worksheet, so they have been our worksheets the whole time. So um, when there is a worksheet on a lesson, the answers will be right down here in your lesson, all for you. Um, here's their worksheet for that day. They're designed to be done independently unless otherwise instructed. There may be part of the worksheet that you do together, and then the rest they'll complete on their own. Um, again, the card games are our main review and practice. Mathematics is a written language, and level A is a gentle introduction to that process. We don't want to take our sweet little four, five, six year olds and dump hundreds of pages of worksheets on them, say go off and, and, and do that. We really want to step through this with them, introduce them to it, and um, for them just to really see math as enjoyable, as puzzles and patterns and games. Okay, one more word about the worksheets is on the copyright page, you'll see that the publisher hereby grants permission to reproduce the worksheets and practice sheets for a single child's use. So for example, if you have twins in one level, then you'll need to get a second set of worksheets for um, the second child. Now, if you have several children, um, then it may actually be a good idea to look at the e-workbook. It's a little bit more, but you can go ahead and make as many photocopies as you need for your family. Um, and so again, that's, that's an option for you. Okay, I'd like to go over a couple um, big concepts that are going to be used throughout Level A. One of them is... Um, it's just why we don't teach to add by counting. So we're gonna pretend we're a child for a second and, um, and think what it looks like to learn how to add purely by counting. And so because we're so familiar with one, two, three, we're gonna use letters instead. 
So A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, E is five. Okay, ready? What's F plus E? Okay, well, let me help you. Let's see. Um, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, we need to add E. A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so I need to count to see how many I have. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Okay, great. I've got K. Now memorize them. This is what it looks like for the child who doesn't understand the quantities and doesn't understand adding. It, it just looks like magic that's something that they're not good at and everybody else gets for some reason. So the problem with counting is that it's not natural. It takes years of practice. It really provides a poor concept of quantity. It ignores place value. And it's very error prone. We've all had the experience where we were trying to count out something, we're counting by ones, and we say, oh wait, let me count again, I think I missed one. And so we wanna give them other tools. Also, counting's tedious and time consuming. It doesn't provide an efficient way to master our facts. So what do we do? Subitizing. What on earth is that? Subitizing is just a fancy word for the quick recognition of a quantity without counting. So how many fingers do I have? Three, right? And none of you had to count. Um, we can do this from um, very young ages. It's something that we're just born with that we can actually do that up to five. Children who subitize, it's just been found that if you can recognize quantities and you understand the quantities, you're gonna perform better in math. It allows the child to grasp the whole and the elements at the same time. And it seems like this is a skill that we need to understanding what the counting process even means. Okay, now if you're introducing to your child and you say, how many fingers? And the child counts one, two, three. Say, okay, great. Can you do it again without counting? Yeah, I've got three. And so you're encouraging them to go ahead and see that quantity. Another thing that we're gonna use is that AL abacus. Um, there are abacuses all over the world. Um, abacus just means beads on a frame. And so all different site types of abacuses exist and the beads can represent different quantities and they're used different ways. But we're going to look at the AL abacus um, that was designed specifically for introducing the arithmetic concepts to children. So um, as far as I know, the ab AL abacus is the only abacus that has two sides. Here's what it looks like. Um, it's a visual and a tactile manipulative. The abacus is going to help our kids develop mental images of quantities, their strategies, and mathematical operations. It's going to promote subitizing, and here's what it's going to look like when, when we use it with our children. So um, when we're just starting out and we've been working with our quantities, we can say, okay, show me three. Yay, good job. That's three. Now show me three on your abacus. Great. Okay. Now if they go one, two, three, then we're going to say, okay, good, good. Now we're going to nudge it over just a little bit and say, okay, can you show me three again? Nudge the next one just a tiny bit. Can you show me again? Teensy tiny bit, can you show me again? Okay, show me three, and they go on. Now occasionally, not very often, but occasionally there's a child who the color throws them off. If so, just nudge that one time, like, can you show me three? Three, and they work their way down. And it's amazing, if a child puts four over, they will self-correct because they see that it won't match the pattern. Three, three, three. Okay, great. So we have three, and this is the symbol for three. Now this seems just obvious to us as adults because we've been doing this for so many years, but it's very important that children understand that this is the symbol for three, but this is actually three. If they don't understand that, then there's gonna be a lot of confusion going on, on down the road. Okay, so we move on. Show me five, yay, it's all the fingers, it's all the beads, and there's the symbol five. We keep working, show me seven, yay, and you notice they're using their left hand for the five and um, their right for the two and it matches the beads so they can see it right there. 
Oh yeah, seven's five and two. I can see that, I don't have to count. And there's my symbol for seven. Okay, show me 10. Yay! And all the fingers, all the beads, there's 10 and there is our symbol for 10. Um, you'll see an activity called building the stairs. And um, this is basically counting with a purpose where they can enter one, two, three, four. They can see the patterns that um, are in their quantities and they actually see the quantity. Okay, what does adding look like on the abacus? When well, we're starting out with our little guys, four plus three, we have four. Okay, now add three more. I've seen that before, that's seven. Great, it's right there, there's no counting. They can see the quantities and how they fit together. Okay, the abacus, you need to have a physical abacus there so that you can develop that mental image. And so you need to let your children use that over and over so that practice is just becoming ingrained in them. They're gonna start with a real abacus that they're seeing and touching and moving and manipulating. Then they'll move to imaginary and then finally to a mental. Now the imaginary abacus, um, can actually come in, there's kind of two versions of this. One is where you leave the, the physical abacus in front of them and they um, don't touch it, but just imagine moving the beads so they can still combine the quantities together and, and do whatever arithmetic they're doing. The other version is where there's not a physical, real abacus in front of them. Instead, they're imagining it, but they're actually using their hand um, and moving it, that may be looking down or, or looking up in the air and imagining um, that they're moving that over. Some kids use both, some just use one. Um, depends on, on what works best for them. And then finally to a mental abacus where you're just seeing the quantities, there's no movement or anything. You're just seeing how the quantities fit together and it makes sense. Um, in your teacher manual in the lesson book, it will suggest when to consider using a mental abacus. But one note, is that if you're zooming along, everything's been going great, and then you hit a concept that's harder for a child and they're struggling or falling into counting or guessing, let them use the abacus, leave it out. It's not cheating. If, if they don't have that comfort level yet, then they're just gonna end up guessing. And so you wanna leave out the manipulative as long as they need it, so then again, they can build that visual memory and it be, can become automatic. Okay, so we talked about the abacus and subitizing. Another thing that, um, that is different um, and very prevalent in level A is what we call the math way of naming numbers. A lot of times children think of 14 as 14 ones instead of 10 and four ones. The pattern that's needed to make sense of the tens and ones is hidden um, by our English language. So here's what it might look like. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then a lot of times kids want to say ten one. And that's what we're going to call the math way of counting. Ten one, ten two, ten three, ten four, all the way down ten nine. Guess what comes next? Two ten. Two ten one, two ten two, two ten three, all the way down, two ten nine, three ten, all the way down, nine ten nine. Um, why do we do this? Well, just the same way that reciting the alphabet doesn't help us be able to read, counting doesn't teach arithmetic. It's the sounds of b and k and g that help us to read when we can recognize that that symbol makes that sound. It's the same thing when we recognize that numbers, what quantity they are, then we can start manipulating them with our different mathematical operations. There's only 11 words um, needed to count with the math way of counting. Um, but with English language, we actually need 28 different words. And so when we don't use the math way of counting, it's almost like we've combined an English lesson and a math lesson together, um, which can be very confusing for some kids instead of just taking it one step at a time. Um, Asian children, because of their language, learn mathematics using the math way of counting. And they understand place value in first grade. And studies show that only half of U.S. children understand place value at the end of fourth grade, which is what causes a ton of um, problems with arithmetic. Math is the science of patterns. And so this patterned way of 
of counting um, and saying our numbers really helps children to learn their number sense and understand their place value. Now, um, any corrections that um, might be made to level A or the worksheets are gonna be put online. The way you can find them is to go to the website, go under resources, teaching support, come down the page and you'll see corrections. You click on that, you can come down to your level, level A, and you'll see the corrections. Um, the most recent updates at the top of the page and you can just look at your copyright page. If the printing is after that, then there's no corrections. If not, you can see them right there. There's the lesson, the date the change was made, and the correction or update. Um, if you still find something you think, no, I really, I think I did find a typo or something, please call us and we'll look into it and see, oh, yes, we need to correct that or, oh no, and we'll help to clarify that. Um, other website treasures are, um, again, under resources. Um, here's pre-recorded webinars. And so there's all sorts of good information on um, the difference between the different editions, how to teach our different levels, um, like you're listening to today. Um, card games, there's some examples of, of different card games being played, um, how fractions are taught all the way down. And so there's some really good webinars available there. Also the blog, um, I, would, I would highly recommend um, looking here. There's some great blogs. The ladies have written just some really um, very readable, helpful blogs about um, games over the summer. Um, we've written That's blogs okay. about lots of the different games. And then okay, uh, also, oh, if you can mute your um, self, that'd be great. Um, as well as games, there's also information about what if I have multiple children? How do I handle teaching when I have um, several children in the home? How do I do the schedule? And um, what if I have struggling learners? There's just a lot of good information out there. Okay, and then just some quick teaching tips. If you can work on the floor, um, it's great. Especially um, with our younger younger kids, you know, they're still kind of at an awkward size for a table. And if you can sit on the carpet with um, to play your game and work with the manipulatives, it actually is a lot easier. The best motivation for kids is intrinsic, and that means internally, where they are wanting to learn, they're wanting to figure this out. Um, external rewards actually can kind of quench that intrinsic motivation. So if we're having to say, okay, we'll, you can have gummy bears if we can just get through this math lesson, then that's actually going to quench, that's going to, that's going to stop working eventually. And so we really want to encourage that intrinsic desire um, to learn. It's, it is just critically important that our children enjoy math. Um, a lot of times the problem isn't isn't math, but it's how we're teaching it. And so um, we want to just be aware of um, anytime stress, it's just difficult to learn um, when there's, when there is stress. And so we want to be just aware of that. And just remember your, your child is doing the best they can. We're going to be introducing new concepts and um, it's just, it's just fun to see them grow in this area. Okay, contact us. On the back of every single book, um, there's our web address and our phone number and email address. Um, we put it there because we want you to use it. So if you have questions, call. If you have questions, email us. Um, look on the website for information and we want, we want to help this really go well for you and your child. Um, are there any questions? Okay, I hope you guys have a great day. Um, let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Bye-bye.